to Coffee with Casey, April 22nd, 2022. Today we're going to take a look at, as we always do, check on the market. But I wanted to find what the market is. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, say, well, how's the market? Well, there's there's a lot of different markets in, um, in our area. So we're going to define how many markets there are. And by the way, you can take a piece of paper out and write it down. How many markets do you think there are in Northern Virginia? Bet you 500 bucks you can't get within 100,000 of how many markets there are in Northern Virginia. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna go with um, how do we identify the market to, to, to do the pricing and what mistakes most people make. And then we're gonna whip over and we're gonna talk about plan B for buyers and sellers. Um, if plan B, A doesn't work, you always have to have plan B. You know, as a coach, you never go into a game with a game plan where you can't adjust or make, you know, make your adjustments. So like they said, game plan is pretty good until seven or eight plays into it and then all heck breaks loose. So we're going to talk about what plan B is for the buyers, what plan B is for the sellers. With all this money at stake, you've really got to know what you're doing. So let's, let's go ahead and, and check in with the market here real quick. Let me whip over to, um, let me get you guys on my screen here. And we'll get you here, and then we'll take you over here. All right. So today we're going to talk about how many markets there are and what the plan B is for the buyers and sellers. So first of all, let's go with what the market's doing now. In general, the biggest indicator is how many homes are under contract. So in Northern Virginia, that means Fairfax County, Prince William County, Loudoun County, and Arlington County, how many homes are under contract? 10 homes are on the market, 7.8 were under contract in January, seven are under contract right now. So you can see it's trending more towards a neutral market, but a seller's market is anything over 60%, okay? So we're trending down there. A buyer's market is anything under 40%. So if 35% if of the homes are, are under contract, that means that 65% are available. So that's a strong buyer's market. So as we can see, we're still in the seller's market, although it's dwindling down. Here's a look at your towns um, from around Northern Virginia. And here you see Arlington's at 63. McLean has been low throughout most of this at 57. And then you can see how your town matches up. Um, Oakton uh, looks a little low because they are a, a smaller market and don't have as big um, a sample size. So that can swing pretty, pretty quickly. But everybody, as you can see, is still in the 70s and 80s. And then usually enough, uh, Leesburg and Percival were really strong earlier, but now they're down in the 65, 67% range. So if you're a seller, you need to know what your market is. So let's, let's talk about markets for a second. So right now we see, what do we see? Three and three and three is 11. You see 11 markets up there, right? Well, really in Northern Virginia, there's 7.7 .7 million markets. Okay, so let me define this. So 7.7 .7 million markets. So I'm just gonna, that's just in Fairfax, Prince William, Loudoun and Arlington, okay? So let's go up here and see that in Fairfax, these are the cities and each market is one square mile. So consider one square mile to be your market. If it's more than that, if it's two miles or three miles, Really, that's not in the same market that you're in. We want to focus on a one mile square. There are 1,317 square miles in these four counties. All right. So let's start with 1,317 markets. Now, in each market, you have homes. Let's take a one mile range in Vienna, say. All right. We got a market in 5,700. You got a market at 1.1 1.3, 1 1.5 to 2 million. So in each one of these square miles, you have eight different price ranges. So go ahead and multiply one, uh, 1317 by eight. Then in each one of these markets, you have homes of different size, right? So we've got different sizes. So take your 1317 times eight times seven, and then you have different ages, right? So 13 times eight times seven times seven. Now, it could be there's a condo market, townhouse market, and single family market. So multiply that number times three. And then each home 
when you get to a home, it's there's five different categories. It's either as is. What we normally focus on is what is a customary house? So a gentleman uh, said, uh, Oak Valley, uh, how much is my house worth? I said, well, you know, a 3,200 square foot house that was built in such and such a time within one mile of you, its customary value is 1.25 million. However, based on condition, based on upgrades, um, you know, that could go up or down 10%, right? How people treat their houses is all different. Some are what's called a family house where the family will just beat the living heck out of it. Others are updated as they go, take great care of their house. Um, some have been renovated where they'll come in and take an old house. And they'll just renovate the whole thing, put a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars into it before you know you have it renovated. So basically the, the, the model is you've got 13, 17 markets times eight times seven times seven times three times five. So we're literally dealing, when a person calls me up, we're dealing with 7.7 .7 .7 .7 markets and I get them from all of them. So let's take a look at how I would quickly be able to price that house. So he's in Vienna, he's got a one square mile. So you go one square mile from his house. His home is uh, in this category. So I'm searching homes from 1.3 to 1.5 that are 300 to 400 square feet. They were built plus or minus 10 years from 2010. Single family house and it's been updated. Boom. In less than seven minutes, we can determine what a house of that value is, right? Of that size and age within a one mile radius. We can tell you with great certainty what the customary value is of the house and what the updated and renovated value is. So, so these models have been tested now for for 10 years. So, so that, you know, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. Now I'll go into a house and somebody will say, well, you know, the house on this road sold for X amount of dollars. Well, they were in this category in that category. Right. And they were probably in this category. So, so we can't take homes that aren't of your category because these are what's called appraisal quality comps, similar size, similar age, similar price range, you know, single families, they've been updated. All right, so, so we want to quickly filter down how do I determine what a house is worth, come up with the customary value. Now, once we get to a customary value, right, then let me turn this thing off. So once I get to a customary value, then we'll determine how updated is it? What are people willing to pay, right? What is it really worth? What is it really gonna sell for? So, so the strategy then is come up out of all that maze out of that 700, uh, 7.7 .7 million markets. What is your exact market? What is the customary value of your home? Then we wanna list closer to the customary value because if it does have upgrades, we want people to bid for those upgrades, bid for them. And a lot of times they'll bid much more than they're worth. I mean, we'll say an upgraded value could be, but again, let me give you a perfect example. We had an updated value at 1.2 million and the sellers got 1.4 million. So there is a premium. People are paying a premium over what it should be because there's a scarcity of houses. And that's why we continue to watch, you know, what, you know, what the market is. So with every market, when I go to the market and I talk to the sellers about their home and their customary value, we also have to know what your number is. Is it 70? Is it 78? Is it 85? Is it 92? In other words, how many homes in the 1.3 to 1.5 range within one mile or two miles of this house that are similar age and size? What is the market for that? Four under contract, none on, uh, active. So we have no competitors. Do we have five actives and one under contract? So then we are in a buyer's market. So you really need to know when you talk about markets, what is your market? You know, what is your one mile radius, same age, same size, same price range? What is that market doing, right? That's why I do this show because things are gonna change. And right now they're gradually changing, but most of the buyers that have been running around feverishly looking for houses, I mean, feverishly looking for houses are all pretty much under contract. So 
I, I think we probably had about seven or eight of them that were very frustrated. And I think most of them are under contract right now. Um, so the, we are easing it up and buyers are starting to have a little bit more control in some markets. Now, let's talk about plan B for the buyers and the sellers. So plan B for the sellers. It's been a while since we had a house that didn't get bid up crazy, go under contract, no home inspection, no appraisal. I mean, it's been a while. It's been a good, you know, eight, nine months. So, and the only houses that didn't sell, you know, the seller would get, we'd go on for 1.85 and they would get 1.99 and didn't want 1.99. They want a 2.1 or whatever. They weren't happy with 100,000 or 150,000 over, over customary value. So they just pulled the house off the market. And that's fine. I mean, you know, people have, you know, want what they want. But for the most part, everybody has their 100 to 300,000 over list price, um, no inspections and no appraisals. But, you know, a lot of that's leaving. So we need to know what plan B is. So here's plan B. We put the house on the market. We think we're going to get a rush. We've done our, all our work. We've done our predictive analysis. We've prepared the house for whatever reason. Maybe it's a road. Maybe it's that a house just doesn't have that sex appeal. Maybe it's more of a functional house than a, than a really bells and whistles kind of house. Okay, so the buyers take a pass. What happens is we don't, don't panic, right? If nobody jumps. So you got to allow it two weeks for the buyers to come in, take a look at it, and they don't put a contract in because they don't want to get in a bidding war over this house. They don't want to waste their time given the market value or the list price to a seller that, you know, is expecting a lot more. So they'll wait, right? But then after a week to 10 days, they'll come on back. They'll come on back and take a look and go, you know, that house is still here. And now we have what I call the Mondacks, right? So you got to let them come on back, right? Take a look at it. And once we've cleared the Mondacks, which a majority of the time will develop and we'll bring in a contract or two, because once one contract comes in, you have to notify everybody. And then maybe that brings in a second or third contract and you still get a little bid going on. So, so that's kind of the next phase. Well, the real plan B is this. There are a lot of, of seller buyers that want to sell their house and buy a new house. And they can't compete um, with people coming in here with cash and big down payments and nothing to sell, and no contingencies. They just can't compete, right? But they can now. So that's called contingent on the sale of your home, right? So I will buy your home contingent on me being able to sell my home. So that I will tell you is 50% of the market, right? So 50% of the people really that want to buy know they can't compete because they have to sell their house. So here's what we do. If we go beyond the second or third week, then we start marketing that we will clearly accept a home sale contingency, right? So if your sellers don't have anywhere to go, I'm talking to the Samson agents, if your sellers don't have anywhere to go and they're not in a big rush, which is fine. Now we can open up to that secondary market. The secondary market of people that have a home to sell, but don't want to go out and compete with homes that, that aren't you know, buying without a contingency on the home sale. So now you go to the houses that have been on the market for two or three weeks. For whatever reason, they've cleared, they've cleared that first wave of buyers. Now you can come back in. Now you offer, hey, we will accept contingent contracts. We will take you know, contingent on the sale of your home. Why? It makes perfect sense. First of all, if the other house, we run a market evaluation on, on this, you know, the, the buyer's home that they're going to sell. And I make sure that it's priced correctly and it's got everything it needs. And, you know, to be honest with you, if the house is priced correctly, it's sexy, good, popular neighborhood, they all go for in about the first four days. So I'm not concerned about taking a because their home is easier to sell than our home. For whatever reason, it didn't, 
it didn't have 27 buyers running in the door all waving contracts. There's probably will. So let's take it. And now the goal is not to sell our house it's sold. It's to make sure their house gets sold, which is easier to sell than our house. All right. For whatever reason. That doesn't mean that we'll accept a contract where somebody's going to put an $800,000 house on the market for nine fifty. dollars Not going to happen. But here's the way the process works. We accept a contract as a seller that is for 30 days and allow them to sell their house. It's a 30 day contract, but it has a 72 hour kickout clause, which means that if another buyer were to come in and look at your house and say, I really like this house, I'll give you 1.5 and I don't have any contingencies. The seller would accept that contract contingent on the other contract kicking out. So what would happen is the listing agent notifies the buying agent that we have ratified a contract. You have 72 hours to prove you can go to settlement. Hey, by the way, don't let me forget to talk about um, interest rates and the 10 year arms. Hopefully I remember that. Um, Michelle, send me text. Um, so, um, where was I? I got thrown off. But anyways, the technical way of doing that is if somebody comes in and we accept a contract, we notify the first contract, you have 72 hours to prove that you can go to settlement, right? That your home is under contract, that you passed all the contingencies and you have to remove the contingency, the financing contingency, the appraisal contingency and all contingencies and go to settlement. So, so basically we do have an out if we accept a, a, a contract from somebody with a contingent on sale, it's only gonna be on for 30 days. So we're off the market for 30 days, but we're really on the market because they can come, still come see the house. They can still come make offers on the house. We can still accept offers. We just need to give them a 72 hour notice that they need to remove all their contingencies and move on with settlement. So that's plan B. And when you think about it, the market for of people that are um, need to sell their house before they buy a house is huge, but they're dug in and they're gone, right? They're gone because they found out they couldn't compete, so they left the market. So we got to go find them, which not as easy as it looks, but we do have the email addresses of the 500 agents that have stored searches from six months ago. So let's say I go back to a house that we sold for a million three, four months ago. It had 800 people that were in that buyer pool, right? All right, well, now the buyer pool may be down to 200, 250. So what we do is we say, take this house, show it to those 800 realtors and say, guess what? You can buy this house and we will accept a home sale contingency. Well, now that agent has rekindled her sellers slash seller slash buyer and now they have two you know basically two deals so you can bet that going back to the realtors from three months ago who had those stored searches and half of their clients gave up half their clients had to sell their house so they couldn't get one so they just left so we go back and market this house to those agents now that's plan b okay so you can't, if a house doesn't sell, which now you're gonna have more of that, we're going back, we're gonna go back a little bit. If you have a house that doesn't sell, you can't stick your head in the dirt. You have to market it to the Monbacks if it doesn't sell the first weekend. Once we clear the Monbacks, that's when we go for plan B, which is a whole new market, which is all the people that couldn't sell a house or need to sell a house in order to buy a house. That's a big market. Plan C, after 30 days, after this has failed, and this has failed, and this has failed, that's when you start talking about price reduction, okay? So that is your seller plan B. Now you need to dust off that playbook. I'm talking to Samson agents again. You need to dust off that playbook and know what to do. You cannot sit your, stick your head in the sand and just let it happen because when we meet with sellers, it is two months prior probably to this date. So back then, it's a different market. I mean, hey, we're getting 100, $150,000, $200,000 premiums on our houses. Now we're still getting them on some. So we did just have a $300,000 premium. 
we did just have a $200,000 premium, but we did have two houses that didn't sell. Plan B, right? For whatever reason, location, functionality, whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, they didn't. The price right. So within the next, if it doesn't go first week, get the mom backs. If you don't get the mom backs, then you reach out to all the realtors that have sellers that have homes to sell. And that is 50% of the market. And they are underserved because they have been unable to buy a house. Now they can, now they can. So now let's talk about the buyers, okay? Well, the buyers, it's the exact, exact same thing. You're looking at homes that didn't go through the bidding process. Now you say to yourself, what's wrong with that house? There's nothing wrong with the house. For whatever reason, it just didn't appeal to those perfect buyers. So you want to be one of those monbacks. You want to let everybody, let it clear all the bidding stage, right? And I would say that pretty much if you clear that first weekend and you're sitting on there, 50% of those houses sell in the monback period. And then that other 50% will sell after that. But if you are a buyer and you have a home to sell, now's the time to go out and look for homes that have been on the market for at least 10 days. I will tell you, I, I will tell you that I know agents have not been, um, have not been um, that receptive to home sale contingencies but I can guarantee you if I walk in with the right price and we can prove that the home is going to go on the market and it's in great shape and we have pictures and you know, I've got pricing and I got pricing models. I can prove to you, I'll sell within four days. We can get that deal for us. So before no chance. Now there's a chance. There's a chance. And when people's houses don't go on the market and don't sell in the first weekend, they get a little shocked. They're a little shocked and they're a little nervous. So that's when you can come back, I would say in that 10 day to 12 day period, that's when you come in and make your offers on some of these houses, okay? Also, let's, let's talk about another plan B for the buyers. Our team puts emphasis on preparing homes prior to us listing them. We wanna make sure we put in paint and hardware and, you know, Billy and Morgan and those guys, they fix up bathrooms and showers and, and um, hardware and, and lighting fixtures. So it all looks great, right? And it does look great. And that way we get top dollar for our house. But not every, sell, not every seller wants to do that. Not every realtor wants to recommend it. A lot of realtors just want the listing. So they'll come in and say, hey, this looks great. Let's just go with it, right? But I will tell you that we've proven that we can get seven to, seven to 10 times our money back when we improve a house. So if I was a buyer, I would find a house that has not been painted. In fact, may have ugly paint, but you're looking for space, feature, function, location. You're looking for lot and location. So, you know, I would kind of go out there and, and A, if houses haven't made it 10 days, that would be my market that I'm looking at. Um, if houses pull off the market, that would be somebody I would look at. Maybe they, you know, come to a realization that they really were at a peak. Um, I would look for houses where the, the, they haven't been smartly put together and marketed. Now, sometimes you'll look online and the pictures are awful. I can tell you, I am disgusted with seeing some of the pictures on most houses on the internet. So maybe the pictures look horrible. Maybe that just doesn't show well. That's what you want to go after. Space, feature, function, location, neighborhood, yard. Go get them. They're coming. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen yet. We're still down 15 to 18% in inventory from a five-year average. So that's across the board. <clears throat> Vienna's even a little lower, you know, like negative 23% or something. So no, we don't have the inventory yet. But the buyers can still get out there. You can still get some of these homes that don't sell in that first weekend. You're not competing. You can still go contingent on the sale of your house um, and look for homes that need, need work. You do the work. You put in what's, what's called sweat equity. I know everybody's busy. Everybody's so damn busy now, uh, I guess, trying to afford gas and, and the cost of living. But, you know, we are, we are busy. Everybody works. And that's why it's very valuable 
that when people walk into those homes, that that bucket list of things to do has already been done. It's called turnkey. Turnkey gets the biggest money, right? So, you know, we do it. All you got to do is find out a home that didn't do it. Find out somebody, and this is another one, find out someone that overpriced their house. So this is what the prices have looked like, right? So what's going to happen is the prices are going to go like this, but people are going to still price their houses up here, right? They're going to assume it's still going, but it didn't. It'll flatten, right? So when it flattens, what we want to do is catch people that priced it wrong, right? It doesn't sell. And then we come along and prove the price is here. And that's where we get it at. So take advantage of realtors and sellers that make mistakes by overpricing their houses and do not prepare the house. That's who the buyers want to focus on. Sellers, don't panic. There's a plan B and there's a plan C, right? So right now you go to plan B, wait for them on back, start marketing to them. Uh, then you go to plan C, which is, hey man, bring in your contingent contracts. So you buyers, you're looking at, that have been sitting on the sideline and have something to sell. Um, you know, I know you're frustrated, but you know what? Don't get frustrated. Now's the time when you can actually buy a house and have it contingent on the sale of your home. And it does take talent by your real estate agent on how to prepare. This is the home we're gonna sell, validate the price, validate the condition, validate that it only take four days to sell. You gotta sell that to the listing agent. Okay, now for you buyers, you're going out there now and interest rates were in the high twos and now they're five, okay? So that does have an impact on your payments, all right? So what you wanna do is there is, there, we haven't seen arms in a while because the interest rates have been so low, there's no need for them. But what happens is they're called adjustable rate mortgages where you can lock in the interest rate for 10 years. So you can either pay 5% on your mortgage for a 30 year fixed, or you can pay 4% for a 10 one on. So for 10 years, it's locked in. So you just save 10% of the value over that 10 year period, because you're saving 1% per year, right? So you save 10%. Now in 10 years, a couple things, a couple things will change. One, as the markets are strong, they'll raise interest rates to slow them down. And when they get weak, they'll bring the interest rates back down. When they do, that's when you refinance. Just wait. I mean, this is a cycle, right? So you get the 10% arm, lock in for 10 years. And within the next 10 years, interest rates will go up and then interest rates will come down. And when they get down to that lower level in the low threes, that's when you go ahead and refinance and lock in your three, whatever, 30 year fixed loan and you're good to go. But during that time period, you just save, you know, if you do it in six years, seven years, you just save 7%. So if you bought a seven, if you bought a million dollar house over those seven years, you just save 70,000 bucks. On a, on a $1 million mortgage, you would have saved $70,000. So, so consider that it's time for us to start looking now, I blew off the 10 one arms uh, about three or four weeks ago because there was only, you have to watch the spread. So let's say it's 5%. And then if it's a half a point spread, then the 10 year arm would be at four and a half percent, half point spread, right? Because this goes like this, right? Watch this. It's down at four, it's a full point. So I'm telling you that if you're going to buy, that's a full point. A lot of times it's a quarter point benefit. Now it's a full point. Swing to the 10 one arms. I'm just telling you, I know people are going, hey, this caused a problem back in 2007, 2008. It did not. That was not the reason for the collapse. The reason for the collapse was people were buying homes. They couldn't afford it. Uh, they were not getting, you know, there was, this is not 2008 all over again. I'm just telling you, it's not 27, 28. But a prudent thing to do is consider a 10-1 arm, save that one point per year for an extended period of time, then refinance, and then lock it in within the next 10 years. Okay, you've been listening to Coffee with Casey. My name is Casey Sampson. I'm at 703-508-2535. You can reach me at Casey at CaseySampson.com. 
Julie has put together a heck of a website at caseysampson.com where you can get a ton of information. Stay up to date on market conditions. Look at some of the beautiful houses we have. And if you're thinking of selling or buying, give us a call. Next week, it won't be 11 o'clock. It will be 2 o'clock, Coffee with Casey. So we'll see you then. Bye now.